So, Charlie, thanks very much for joining us on the Ideas Lab podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It's good to be here. Yeah, I first heard of your story something like eight years ago where you came up with this idea for, I think, what I describe as a healthy ice cream. Would you want to explain what OPPO is? Is it yeah. healthy? Is it? I, I noticed you're using the, the words uh, low calorie on your website now. Mm, healthier. Eight, eight years ago, gosh, well, that really was at the beginning, at the absolute beginning. I didn't realize we, we've, we've been together for quite so long. Um, Oppo is a healthier ice cream. Um, I say healthier, not healthy, because um, it's, well, you don't go to ice cream for, for function, uh, for health, for it's not your five a day, uh, and it shouldn't be. Um, it's all about indulgence, enjoyment, pleasure, uh, that dopamine hit, the reward hormone after a hard day at work or a long week or, or, or just Netflix and chill on the sofa. Um, and so it's all about taste and indulgence. And that, in my view, is what uh, many uh, healthier ice creams are doing wrong at the moment. We've got to remind ourselves why people go to the ice cream category in the first place. Um, so, yes, we are reduced calorie, reduced sugar. Um, so fewer calories and less sugar than an apple per portion, in fact, actually, to put oh. it in uh, in comparison. Um, it's not as healthy as an apple, but um, but in comparison. But we have four great taste award gold stars. Um, in fact, we beat haagen um once uh, in a blind taste test, uh, really? which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, in a blind taste test. Um, and and the, the great taste awards is where uh, I think it's 300 judges blind taste test about 14,000 products. Um, and they say what what they prefer purely on a taste uh, basis. So they didn't know it was a healthier ice cream. So we're thrilled that we got four great taste awards um, for, for various products. So yeah, we are great tasting ice cream first, uh, but not at the expense of your health or the planet second. That's really good. And it, and it shows that you've really thought through this positioning, which a lot of people don't do. So it, it's, it's like we're still trying to do something and you're still trying to do something indulgent but which is actually a marked improvement over the current options. And I've a, I have remember eating half a tub of it while I was, was that interview you, Harry? I can't remember. Um, but a few years back. A few years ago, Harry. Yeah, it was Lovely. Harry. I thought so. And um, uh, it, and it was very tasty. It's quite difficult to stop eating. You. I just noticed you've got a, what is it? A, a salted caramel one, which sounds uh, quite dangerous. So, yeah, yeah. Double salted caramel now because we've added swirls and things in it. So every one of our tubs now has chunks and swirls and inclusions and and um and interest like that in it um mm. but uh yeah well we, what to be honest what we had a few years ago was definitely that was what i would have created um definitely not as good as what we've got now uh we'll have, we'll have to get you some more uh we now have a, a team of, of product developers uh and and scientists essentially um who uh who, who create what we think well we're trying to create the world's best ice cream that's what we're trying to do um, create the world's best ice cream. Many people, when they say the world's best something in a food category, are just purely focusing on taste. Um, but we think that taste is king, but also health is crucial. You can't create something that's the world's best food product if it's bad for your body. Um, and thirdly, uh, the planet uh, can't be uh, the world's best anything if it if it destroys the planet. So um, those three things are key to us. But we'll have to get you some more at some point. Yeah, no, I'm very happy to receive and do a taste test. So uh, maybe we should do a competition or something. Um, yeah, we so, could do that. Yeah, okay, that would be cool. Um, it's and when you started, you had this idea because I think it was was it you? I think it was Harry read the book but one screw work, let's play many years ago, and that was partly what kind of inspired him along the way. It, it both definitely of was. You. He got in touch with you. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and but you also got inspired to do this crazy journey across Brazil, which we've mentioned in my new book. So you're one of the amazing stories featured in um, the new book, Fuck Work, Let's Play. And uh, I love the fact that you went on this, probably what was the worst planned, um, <laughs> uh, what is a world record breaking travel trip ever? Do you want to just explain what that was? Yeah, we hadn't got a clue what we were doing. Um, Mum and Dad did try and talk us away from it, but we did it anyway. Um my brother and I had always been very into windsurfing, kite surfing, actually not kite surfing then, but windsurfing um, and wind sports. I was at university and Harry and I had always gone on trips uh, through all of our university holidays. And uh, I was leaving uni. He's three years older than me, so he'd already gone. I was leaving uni, starting to join the real world and thought, 
you know, this is the last hurrah kind of thing. This is this is the last. Um, what what can we do that's that's, that's batshit crazy uh, and is going to be great fun before we join the real world and have salaries and normal jobs and nine to fives? So we picked the best place in the world to go windsurfing, which was the northeast coast of Brazil, and then realised the nearest airport was a thousand kilometres away. So we thought, how the hell are we going to travel a thousand k? There's no roads, like direct roads there. There's no, um, there was no other way of getting there because it was such a remote place. As it happens, it's not anymore, actually. I think there is a road going there, but but uh, 10 years ago or so, there wasn't. And uh, so we started to find, we, we thought it could be quite interesting if we travelled that thousand kilometres under our own steam. Um, so we looked at being a windy area, the windiest part of the world, as I said. Um, we looked at land yachting it. Um, we also looked at cycling, actually. Uh, along the beach with all of our gear. I quickly vetoed that one. Um, I suggested we run it. Harry vetoed that one. Um, and eventually we saw a YouTube video. And uh, being a university student, I often flicked through YouTube mindlessly. And this YouTube video that I happened upon showed people kite buggying up and down sand dunes, really, you know, going incredibly fast, looking to kind of look like the kind of terrain that we we're going to face in Brazil. And kite so buggying is like a, basically... A big- it, yeah, I was going to ask. It's a beach buggy with a giant kite attached or something? Yeah, it's kite surfing on land. Uh, that doesn't you sound very in, safe to me. It's not. You <laughs> sit in a – it's not how we do it anyway. Uh, we'd never done it before. Uh, we sit in a, a go-kart with um, – so we got this go-kart bespoke built for us in New Zealand, actually by the person whose world record we were about to break. Very kind of him to create them for us and ship them over from New Zealand. And they have wheels as big as car tires, no brakes, no seat belt, no steering wheel. Um, but you, you're you pulled along by this massive kite that's, a, that's harnessed onto you, it's attached onto you. And we, um, I was on crutches until a week before we left from a mountain bike accident. So we literally had no training at all. And uh, we arrived on this beach in Brazil, having talked our way through Heathrow excess baggage, 150 kilos of gear we had. Um, but we were wearing, proudly wearing our Centerpoint charity t-shirts that we were doing it for. And um, Centerpoint's a fantastic homeless charity. Um, or rather, they help homeless people. Um, they aren't homeless themselves. And uh, we arrived on this beach in Brazil, um, built the buggies up and started to learn to kite. Um, we went two kilometers in the first day, uh, so only another 998 to go, which was quite a shock to the system. But I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase because um, I don't want all of your listeners to get too bored with me wittering on. We ended up uh, running out of food. So frequently on this expedition, we uh, we had to, to run our buggies um because uh, if there were ever a an obstacle like a mangrove swamp or a cliff or whatever, then we had to pack the bu- the kites down and we'd have to run with these buggies, 75 kilo buggies on sand. <laughs> we burnt through food. We then so we ran out of it and we were speaking to locals whenever we could find anyone. It's such a remote place. There's not even maps for the area at the time. We couldn't find anything. So um, there was hardly a Tesco around the corner. So we're speaking to locals saying, what can we eat? What's going to keep us going? They showed us various foods that tasted absolutely amazing, yet also were very healthy and, and made us finish the expedition. Um, they probably tasted incredible because we were so hungry, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> um, I'd lost eight kilos of body weight in two weeks, so we definitely needed some food. Um, but this is what gave us the the inspiration for, hang on, why can't the most indulgent food also be good for you? Why does the chocolate cake, why can't it be as healthy as an apple? And I know this is very... Um, um, uh, purist thinking or, or whatever, idealist thinking, but but why not? And then looking through all the all the industries around the world, there's the travel, tech, banking, whatever. In the last 50 years, every industry has 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 accelerated exponentially and is is, broad, is, is vastly different to what it was like 50 years ago. Um, as I say, even even uh, age old industries like banking uh, have, have really changed. Um, yet we're less healthy than we were 50 years ago. We've gone backwards. There's something really screwed up here. Um, we, we didn't have the obesity crisis, the diabetes crisis, et cetera, 50 years ago, um, and, but we do now. So um, there's a, an inherent obvious issue um, and, and what I thought was an obvious solution. Let's make indulgent food healthier. People always eat what they want. They will eat what they want. They should eat what they want. We have different pressures now, but, but let's make it healthier. Surely we've got that capability within us now uh, to do that. We, we finished the expedition, came back home. I worked for Diageo, uh, the alcohol company, for one year. Um, I was on their, their fast track grad scheme. Um, it was meant to be a three-year scheme, but after a year, I said, no, I've, I've got to do this idea. So quit my job, moved on to Harry's sofa in Brixton, 
and uh, actually sofa surfed around uh, remortgaging every friendship I had around London uh, for the next two and a half years. Um, and, uh, and, and to try to try and create um, as healthier ice cream as was physically possible. Why ice cream? Because for two reasons, really. Firstly, it was the most indulgent category I could think of, um, other than maybe alcohol, which is quite challenging to make healthy. But also because one of the foods we ate out in Brazil um, was a part frozen, smooth, part frozen smoothie in a bowl um, called acai na tigela, which literally means acai in a bowl. It looks like ice cream. It tastes like ice cream. It's very healthy. So that was the inspiration. Um, and so, yeah, it took me two and a half years, government grants, grants from my old university, um, before eventually we created something that uh, I was happy to launch. Um, and you, you, you hadn't studied food, right? I mean, you weren't a no. food person particularly. You just, you just started experimenting, trying to make this ice cream. Well, I knew a lot about taste and flavour. Um, from my time managing um, cocktail bars, mixology bars, and doing lots of wine tasting with people, and working for Diageo, of course, who own Johnny Walker, Bailey's, Bell's, Guinness, Red, everything. They're world's largest spirit company. Um, and on, when I was at Diageo, I, I was taken under the wing of um, the global whiskey ambassador. Um, and it, it was extracurricular, shall we say, but I loved it, and he taught me an awful lot. Uh, so we used to go around bars um, and, and restaurants teaching their staff how to use our whiskies um, and what they could do with them and how to appreciate them and how to, to discuss and talk with, with, the, with the customer uh, about the whiskies. So I did know an awful lot about taste and flavor, um, but nothing about food, nothing about ice cream, nothing about food science. Uh, I'd studied crime and criminal justice at university just before that, so uh, useless. Um, but it's amazing what Google can teach you, and also two and a half years of banging your head in a in a in a cold dark room, um, trying to trying to scour through Google uh, to teach you. So, yeah, would have made fewer mistakes, but um, <clears throat> that's what yeah, it's about. I mean, to learn. it does strike me that you do seem to have a, a an abnormal level of uh, kind of persistence. <laughs> well, both you and your brother, an abnormal level of persistence and confidence. Do you think is that just a, a good healthy upbringing, or because? I did um, not have anything like that when I started out. You know, it's just, um, it's very impressive. I think every single person who starts a company has got to have a ton of persistence and resilience. The amount of things that went wrong, uh, and Oppo is no different, um, the amount of things that went wrong in our early days uh, for the first five years, actually, um, it just felt like everything was against us. All the time, you turn another corner and you you, you get um, you, you get another roadblock. Um, but there's there's two ways of dealing with them. There's... There's expecting they're going to come all the time and not being faced by it, cracking on. Um, there's knowing why you're here and what your ambition is so that you can continue to look to the horizon, even if there seems to be a ton of mountains in the way. Uh, you can still look to the horizon and, and visualize what it's going to be like when you eventually get there and climb those mountains. Um, and also you uh, you try and have fun along the way uh, and try and, and learn and remind yourself why I'm here in the first place. For me, it was because I really believed in the in, in our ambition and what we were trying to create. I thought it'd be an awesome utopia if we could do it, if we could create an ice cream that was was so indulgent yet so healthy. Um, and I was here to learn and, and to have fun, and I was doing those two things. So um, yeah. then the journey becomes a lot of fun, uh, and, and the journey's great, and we'll have many roadblocks. It's, it's not a problem. But also it's about treating the roadblocks in the right way, I think. So Ryan Holiday has a book called The Obstacle is the Way. Yeah. Um, and and I'm sure many people know about it. It's um, if you reframe it like that, and it's also, in my experience, broadly true. Then um, then each obstacle you suddenly realise is actually a gift to a, a greater path. So yeah, and I think that's really important, isn't it? And it's it's so going in with the right expectation is really important. If you expect that, you know, once you've got a good idea everything will unfold easily for you. You're going to be very disappointed. <laughs> it, and you'll fail it, in a month. Yeah. Yeah. And also the advantage of doing something hard. Uh, Paul Graham talks about, um, he uses this analogy. He's the founder of Y Combinator that, that uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. launched Dropbox and Airbnb, many of a billion dollar companies. And he says, if you're being chased by a big competitor, the you shouldn't. You can't outrun them. You can't outmuscle them. Run upstairs. And what he means by that is basically tackle the hardest damn thing you can do, because companies like 
you know, Microsoft and Google and Apple who are on your tail, they may have lost that ability to take on, and, you know, you went up against people like Unilever and, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on. And um, they have a lot of might, but they don't necessarily have the ability to do the yeah. really, really hard things. I approached the global head of food innovation uh, at Unilever in 2013. So that was a year after I quit my job. Um, and about, I didn't know it then, but about halfway into creating what I wanted to create and told him what I was doing. Um, and he said, look, we spent, I forget the exact amount, but it was something like 15 million trying to create a healthy ice cream. Uh, and he, he, he kindly sent me over all the patents that they had secured on it, but done nothing with. And he said, just don't infringe those. Um, but he said, we spent 15 million or whatever it was trying to create healthy ice cream and failed. Don't bother. Don't do it. You know, you're one person by yourself. Um, and actually what he was kind of failing to realize there is something that you touched on earlier is intelligent naivety. Um, yeah. Not knowing what the rules are makes them a ton easier to break. Uh, and unfortunately, all the Unilever scientists did know why they couldn't take sugar out of ice cream, why they couldn't take fat out, why they had to use the certain additives that they currently use. So they never tried to take them out. Um, and, and, and I just sent him a photo where Noppo was eventually on the shelf um, uh, with a smiley face. Um, uh, and he just sent one back with Oppo already in their innovation kitchen in Unilever headquarters. They were reverse engineering it. Um, and, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And lo and behold, um, a year later, Breyer's Delights came out, um, which is their low calorie um, variation of Oppo. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> even then, it hasn't worked. And that actually now it's already, it was only in the market for a year already. It's exited the UK market. Wow. Um, I think it's doing okay in Germany and Holland. Uh, growing, but growing slowly. But in the UK, it hasn't worked and they're taking it out. And I don't think it will last long elsewhere. So yeah, big boys can't do things that small boys can sometimes, but that's not saying that we are any different to them or better than them or anything like that. Um, I think our measure of success is just different to what Unilever would, would measure theirs as. Yeah, that's true, actually. And it, I mean, when you were starting out in those early days, you said you were couch surfing. Didn't you end up... Um, Sleeping under a desk at some point. What was, the, what was the story there? I did. So we needed a brand. We also needed a product and a, and a manufacturer. So I was going around lots of um, factories trying to get them to manufacture for us. And I just had an idea. I didn't have a product. I didn't have a brand. I didn't have any funding. I didn't have a team. No track record. So it was pretty hard to get people on board. Same with branding. Um, same goes there. And so one day, one of them said, look, we will come on board if you get a product. Uh, that was the, the a branding company. Uh, and uh, the factory said, look, we'll come on board if you get someone to design your packaging for you. And then we'll all work together. Um, so I told them both at the same time that I'd got each other. And, and luckily, they both came on board. Uh, actually, it wasn't the right. In hindsight, it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, product is king, and I should have waited on all the branding until the product was totally finished. But we can talk about that later. But yeah, I um, ended up. Uh, I didn't. I was so unbelievably focused on. It's, it's crazy to look back at it now on what we were doing on what I was trying. We said we. It was only me. What I was trying to do um, that I didn't see any friends, didn't have a social life, didn't do anything, and. The thought of a commute was was just wasted time. I, I could, you know, I was like, that's twenty minutes on the tube, and I could be doing something. So I was very lucky to ask for a, a, a desk in this branding agency who were doing it for free for us. Um, so um, they gave me a desk, and then they just thought I was the last person in, so the last person out, and the first person in every morning. But actually, I was sleeping under the desk as well. Um, uh, they had a kitchen there and a shower. So what more did I need? So yeah, seven days a week, um, I wouldn't go home at weekends at all. I just keep cracking on. Um, well, yeah. I, I just think that's amazing. And it's... Um, Until yeah, they caught me out, that was. <laughs> Until right. they caught me. She came in early one day and I was still <laughs> in my sleeping bag. You're sort of walking around in your box of shorts yeah. or something. She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, you're actually in your sleeping bag. Yeah. And did, did they say, like, you've got to stop doing this? Well, I also did it in my factory actually once and I got caught there as well. Um, I didn't have, I couldn't have, didn't have the money to go into a bed and breakfast. Um, the factory was work in Scotland. So uh, I would... I managed to find the code for the uh, R&D kitchen um, and I would bring my sleeping bag in and sleep there when everyone else had gone. Um, <laughs> and, and I think I'd only sleep about three hours, two or three hours a night because I didn't have time. I was making a lot of recipes up there. Uh, went through thousands of recipes. So it takes a lot of time to do that. So you've got to crack on um, until they caught me and then they changed the code. 
It's unfortunate. <laughs> That's amazing. So it's been quite a journey. And as you say, it, it's, the, it's the mission that has really kept you. You know, you really believe in the idea that you should be able to have something really indulgent that's good for you, at least, mm. you know, not going to harm your health. And that that's what drives you, is it? Yeah. Um, it's, it's achieving the, the impossible and, and trying to be a bit more uncompromising. Um, and whenever anyone says you're back, back then, well, that's not possible. Um, it just, it just, I think demonstrated that we were probably on something because people would want it. And it's the whole analogy of climbing up the stairs whilst, you know, it's trying out smart your competitors or so. Um, but the thing that really made the, and this is why I do say us a lot, it, the, what made the marked difference to the business was when my brother came on board. So I was creating the ice cream and he was very kindly uh, at points housing me uh, on his sofa in a one bed flat. Um, and, uh, but when he eventually, and there's a story around it, but I won't bore you with it now. When he eventually said, you know what? Yes, I will join. Uh, he'll leave his very well paid, successful job uh, as head of marketing and joint venture with Google, uh, which he was really quite enjoying, um, to come and, and, and do a, a sofa startup with me, um, was incredible. Everything changed. He's a remarkable guy. And he, he's my absolute best friend. And um, whilst I might have an idea, he actually does it. Um, he, 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 he is, okay, that's interesting. He'll often say it's rubbish, um, and they are, but sometimes he'll, he'll do that. And, and um, it, it's just surprising how many people manage to create a company with just themselves leading it, just a single founder, because um, I definitely never, ever could. Uh, having a co-founder is something that's been... Um, essential for us and, and Harry's amazing for that. So really lucky there. We're total foils of each other where I'm rubbish, he's excellent. It's quite a unique relationship. Yeah, and we talked about that in the in the book. So you can read more about that in Fuck What Let's Play. But we talked a bit about the Bell being roles and how you're yeah. different roles, which I think is quite interesting. So now the company is quite sizable. How many people have you got working? Oh it's for not sizable, I wouldn't say there's there are I'm looking at at the moment there's uh, eighteen of us now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and you're in thousands of stores. Yeah, we are in about five thousand, um, maybe six thousand now. Um, supermarkets across about twelve countries. We are we have about thirty eight percent market share in Holland. Um, so we're the largest healthier ice cream. Um, we are growing about one hundred and twenty percent year on year. Um, so over over doubling. Um, so yeah, we're 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 lucky. It's been a really good time. And what's on your mind now? Do you have, uh, you know, grand plans or is a particular focus of the business right now? Um, continue to continue striving to make, you know, I don't think the product will ever be complete. We're always trying to improve it. So we need to continue doing that. We've built an R&D kitchen a lab in our office here, um, which is just going to help us uh, innovate faster. So we don't have to go anywhere to do it. We can have an idea in the morning and then implement it by the afternoon and see if it works. Um, so continue innovating. Um, and our ambition is to, to, to democratize this health, to, to spread it across to as many people as possible. Um, so that, yeah, people could make the choice between a Ben and Jerry's and a Hagen dazs with 13,000, sorry, 1300 calories per, per tub and how many hundreds of grams of sugar, um, or Oppo that is less than 400 calories per tub always. Um, and hopefully they, 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 they taste the same. Um, so yeah, striving for great distribution and striving to make the product the world's best ice cream. Brilliant. I love it. And if people want to find out more about the business or, uh, get hold of Oppo, um, where should we send people? Um, oppobrothers.com. That's our website or at Oppo brothers on Instagram or LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, I'm Charlie Oppo on most of them. Um, and, uh, yeah, or, or just email me charlie at oppobrothers.co.uk. Say hello. If you think right. we should be doing anything that we're not, let me know. I'd love to hear it. And in the UK, where can we find uh, Oppo ice cream most easily? Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Ocado, Whole Foods, um, or on our website, oppobrothers.com. We were the first um, in Europe, I think, to try and uh, sell ice cream by post. Um, it was challenging, but we've now got there. Uh, so, yeah, we, we will deliver ice cream to you. 
And we've got a code for uh, anyone on uh, who's listening to this who wants it. I can't remember what it is. I've just realized. Um, but I think it's the Ideas Lab or something. But um, okay. maybe in the comments or something, we could put yeah. a code. And people can we'll put that on the on the website page. So when people go to the Ideas Lab, uh, dot org slash podcast and they right. can find your episode then uh we'll, well let's call we'll the code, code the ideas lab let's, okay let's put so we'll call, the code is the ideas lab and they can yep. so they should go to oppobrothers.com to use that and uh i think it'll be six pounds off um oppobrothers.com six pounds off an order with six tubs or more something like that oh, okay that means we great. roughly break even but um but hopefully we can we'll, well, we'll try it yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Charlie. That's just been an amazing story. And I wish you and Harry every luck with uh, what you do next. Thanks so much for having, having me on. Really appreciate it. It's been great to speak to you.